the Lord a shout of praise. Somebody shout glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you expectant tonight? I I want to begin tonight. Hallelujah. I want to begin tonight by honoring and celebrating the lion dwelling in this den. <laughs> A father and a patriarch of faith. We are privileged to share this generation with him. We are privileged to hear his voice. We are privileged to see him and to attend his meetings. And most importantly, to stand on platforms that he raised for our Lord Jesus Christ. Please, let's celebrate one of the finest patriarchs of the faith. Our own dear father, Pastor E.A. Adeboe. You know, it's, it's so humbling, it's so humbling to stand on a podium having to recognize him before you begin to preach. They are men that have shaped the face of Christianity in Africa and in the world. And we are happy to enjoy of the things that he has trapped from the Lord. I want to salute the leadership of the RCCG Youth Nationwide. The global leadership. Special appreciation to my brother and friend, Pastor Daniel. Ole one day. Such a tall platform for Jesus, and it's a great honor to be here tonight. Tonight, I have just a short time to bring you a charge. It doesn't take God eternity to do that, which is eternal. <laughs> a moment in God's presence can be more significant than a lifetime. I pray that we'll be discerning tonight. One of the fathers would also come after me, so there's no point to. I just want to stir the waters. <laughs> and so, if you are ready tonight, <laughs> oh dear Lord Jesus, please salute God's choice servant. A dear brother and friend, Dr. Samuel Amo. <laughs> I'm sure you have been drinking of the waters from his fountain. It's a man of great wisdom, man of power and the presence. I came with my friend, Apostle Bayo Akintadi. Apostle Bayo is also a youth pastor in RCCG and is a dear brother. I also came with my brother, Apostle Elijah Olopade. A 
And so tonight, without any further ado, are you ready? Lift your hands toward heaven and begin to speak in tongues. There are many technologies in God that makes for transport in the spirit. One of the most potent spiritual infrastructure for gaining ascendance in the spirit is the technology of tongues. It was not available for the saints of old. But in our time, we can always gain ascendancy by praying in the Holy Ghost. So come up here, come up here, come up here. Pray in the spirit. When spirits utter their voice, they speak from mountains. So only men that elevate can hear the voices of spirits. Go ahead and pray in the Holy Ghost. Give me sound, brother. We are about to fly. Baraha se vekila paratida van desizak. Pray, Baroa se vekila paradavak. Ayala van de afakira paradavak. Sezavayana, Marianda, Fabretida, Zazese, Zazazazila paradavak. Maravahila Fahiva Dadia Zaza Zavela Kida Kariala Bande Kiso Zavaliga Pai Bredita Fondre Sila Parakira Zedondro Fracta Parak Sabak Lelila Pateki Parakala Radiano Sabratira Paragavak So you reign, you ancient Zion's king, Kadosh Kadoku, you are mighty on. You reign, you ancient Zion's king, Kadosh Kadoku. again we ask that you pour upon us of your spirit we ask that you grant us access into the depths of wisdom bring us into the plains of the dwellings of light grant us access into the depths we are the wisdom that crafted the foundations of the earth dwell give us strength and capacity tonight to look upon you as you are You know, the 
there is a raging force that is coming to our generation. There's a movement orchestrated from darkness to thwart the operation of God in the souls of men. There is a subtle seduction from the bellies of Hades designed to seduce you from a walk with the Spirit of God until the heaven and the civilizations of Zion become alien to you. Even the word of God will no longer make meaning because you are not aware that there is a wisdom that is orchestrated from darkness and is designed to seduce you until you depart from Elohim. The reason we gather in conferences like this is to sound the alarm. Is to sound the alarm. This is not a discipleship platform. This is a ground to sound the alarm that the warriors of Zion will wake up and they will stand in their places in the spirit. The reason we come is to trouble the waters of the spirit so that men we align with the patterns that the ancestors and the patriarchs of faith have established and we will take their mantles and continue their race there is darkness coming but many are not aware can you ask the lord tonight i'm available i didn't come to establish doctrine i came to blow a trumpet you reign, you reign, you precious name if you have seats you can be seated for a second but if the fire is too intense in your bowels and you think sitting is a distraction be my guest <laughs> I need to read the scripture can you hear me clearly Am I audible? My voice has been bought. I've, this voice has suffered. But you have to bear with me. <laughs> I pray that tonight, tomorrow it will be better. Am I audible? Those of you at the back. Can you hear me? If you can, wave. Glory to God. The theme of the conference is go in this thy mind and I need to read maybe two scriptures and explain a few things before we begin to ascend I know so many great teachers have ministered already like Dr. Sam have established so much depth I just want to add two things and then we'll pray for a while before I step aside for a more senior minister for tonight in Judges chapter 6 which obviously is our anchor scripture. From verse 7. You see, and it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites. 
The word Midian is the word strife. There was an agitation. There was a force that threatened the existence of Israel at the time. There was an invasion that attempted to marginalize the possibilities of God that was locked with his people at the time. And Israel understood that strength was not in self. Israel understood that the advantage of Israel as a people was not in the might of their army. Israel understood that the powers that secured the heritage of God with Israel had nothing to do with their military might. They knew that what kept Israel as a people was the covenant they had with an unseen God that dwells in the midst of fire. They had enough spiritual intelligence to know that above the stars there was a being that sat in a realm that cannot be approached. But they had enjoyed favor with this being. And this being had struck a covenant with them. So when strife came against Israel, they didn't go back to recruit their army. They began to cry to the Lord. You know, many times you are troubled and then you begin to consult with your friends. Many times you are troubled and then you begin to go back to your quiver and to your stronghold. Many times you are challenged and the first thing you want to do is to resort to strength in the natural because you don't understand that beyond the veil of mortality there's an immortal one that sat and is concerned about the affairs of your life but Israel knew so when there was strife the first thing Israel did was to cry to the Lord and as Israel cried to the Lord the Lord sent a prophet to them and began to tell them the reason why the Midianites became a factor in the first place. Because on the strength of the covenant that Israel had, Israel had nothing to fear about opposition. You know, it was Paul that began to expound in Romans chapter 9 verse 4. And he said, who are the Israelites? And he didn't say Israel is a nation. Who are the Israelites? He said, unto whom pertaineth the covenants. So when you deal with Israel, you are not dealing with a nation. You are dealing with an, a technology in God that had its root in covenant. The only way you can subdue Israel is to compromise the covenant that bettered that nation. Who are the Israelites? He said, unto whom pertaineth the glory. So Israel was a divine technology. Israel was an attempt of God to establish the government that existed between Elohim in the face of the earth. Because before the foundations of the world, God existed as a self-government. He said, let us make man. That was not one person talking. That was a mystery at work. One talking, but talking as a people. So the Father, the Spirit, and the Son existed as an administration and as a government that was a glory that could not be approached. So Israel was an attempt of God to extend that invincible glory into the natural. He said, who are the Israelites? unto whom pertaineth the glory. You know, if they ask you, for example, who are you? The first thing you will say is, I am a doctor. The reason you will answer like that is because you have not traveled out of time. The day you journey into Zion, you will discover that that thing you recognized yourself with was your least advantage. Because when you enter into Zion, you will be shocked that when they say, who is not? Nat is not a doctor. Nat works on earth as a doctor. Medicine is a platform that gives Nat the opportunity to express God. 
if you go back to the archive of heaven and you say who are you the definition you will hear will surprise you you may be told that you are God's battle axe so naturally everywhere you go you should destroy the forces of darkness but you will be defining yourself as a doctor the reason is because you are working with the definition that the earth have placed upon you he said who are the Israelites he said the ones that pertains the glory but the carriers of the glory of God were being marginalized by strife and so they ran back to God and they cried to him and God sent a prophet to let them know the reason why you have the need to cry in the first place is not because you have lost your place the reason is because you have turned away from me because your advantage is not your army your advantage is not your location. Your advantage is not your territory. Your advantage is who you are in me. And the moment you turned, the Midianites that should be your servants have become your lords. And they carried that burden for a long time until the very integrity of their borders were compromised. A point came that it said Gideon was threshing floor in the wine press because he was afraid they were so intimidated that they were violated and they were comfortable in fear and Gideon had to hide to give expression to what was his own advantage he was threshing floor in the wine press and the angel of the Lord came and sat with him and saluted him you know, when Gideon was given the opportunity to introduce himself, he said he was a weak man from the very least tribe of Manasseh. He didn't see any advantage in the natural. But when the angel saluted him, he said, Thou mighty man of valor. What made the difference? He was dissociated and disconnected from God. So the mighty man of valor became a fearful man. A fearful man so intimidated by his opponent that he did not even have an attempt to fight you know you can be in a place where you are so defeated that you don't even try to fight have you been there before that the spirit of immorality makes a mess of you and you can't even fight back and all you do is cry after you are fornicated are you in that place where the spirit of masturbation have made a slave of you you can't even fight anymore all you do is cry and then you say, I'm a sinner, until an angel appears to you. And he say, oh, thou prophet. And then when you look at yourself, you say, no, prophets are not masturbators. Why? How can I be a prophet? They are defining your reality from Zion. You have become what X says you are. That was the state of Israel. He said, thou mighty man of valor. And the guy said, no, I can't be a mighty man of valor. The stories we heard God did with our fathers, how come we can't see them anymore? And he said, have I not told you, I will be with you. He said, go in this thy might. But you see, if the guy left that way, he will still be defeated. So when we say go in this thy might, it's not to come and motivate people. So that they will go out and say, I'm going in this my might. That's not the idea. Because when he told him, go in this thy might, he didn't stand up and leave. He introduced him into a protocol. A protocol that activates the might that was in him because the might that the man had was not muscles the might that the man carried was the dimension of God that he was destined to give expression to when he said go in this thy might the might is referring to is the dimension of Christ that you are supposed to reveal to your world but you can't just jump out and begin to manifest it and he began to establish him in a protocol that activates the might that was in inside. So going this thy might is not sending you, it's calling you into intimacy. When he said go in this thy might, he's not saying go and manifest. He's actually summoning you into intimacy because there is a lexicon, there is a syllabus of truth that you must be introduced with. And the first thing he did was that he brought him an awareness. The first protocol of going in this dynamite is an awareness. And the awareness he gave him was that I am 
with you. So for the first time, the guy will not be conscious of the armies of the Midianites. For the first time, the guy will be conscious of the armies of God. I am with you. The reason many men are defeated is because they don't know what is with them. Elisha was crying because he thought they were defeated. Meanwhile, Elisha's servant Gehazi was crying because he thought they were defeated. But Elijah was comfortable. And when he met him, he said, are you not aware that the armies are about to destroy us? The reason Elisha was not afraid is not because he's bold. It's because he was aware what was around him. And the guy was so troubled until Elisha had to tell God, please open his eyes, let him see. And when his eyes opened, he looked and he saw chariots of fire surrounding them. Instantly, the fear of the invading force was removed. So the first protocol of going in this dynamite is not an errand, it's a consciousness. This is why we are praying. We are praying that by all means, the heavens will open and you will see your dimension. The first day you see your dimension, you will become afraid of yourself. He said you were fearfully and wonderfully made. The question you should ask yourself is, who was afraid? Because when you were created, nobody was there. You were in a studio of eternity. He said, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. So the one who was there when you were made was Yahweh himself. So the one that was afraid was Yahweh. You were fearfully and wonderfully made, but you have not seen that dimension. That's why you fear. The first protocol is an awakening. If I asked you after this conference, who are you? If you still define yourself as a lawyer, it means you didn't come for this conference. Because this conference is not in this hall. This hall is only the door into this conference. This conference is in the spirit. <laughs> if you think you are in this auditorium, then you didn't participate in the conference. The conference is not in a building. Witches don't go for meetings in auditoriums. Because you can't see your reality in an auditorium. You can't see it. Moses was a stammerer. And suddenly the Bible said, Moses went to the backside of the desert and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God, and God appeared. Instantly something shifted. The man stopped being a stammerer. He became a God. And he said in Exodus chapter 7 verse 1, I have made you a God unto Pharaoh. What happened? It was an awareness. The veils were open. The scales had fallen from his eyes. There are many people who will come here and go back distracted, but it's not your portion. When they say pray, don't joke. Because what we are trying to do is to migrate. When the world is going on, don't joke. Because your word is not a message. Your word is, it can be a sentence. It can be a phrase. It will be shot into your heart. And all of a sudden you will rise. And when you rise, you'll be a warrior. You will be a warrior. Something will shift. Because the first protocol of going in this dynamite is an awareness. It's an activation. I am with you. And instantly, the Midianites became like ant. He said they sent ten spies to survey the city. And they got there. And they said they were like grasshoppers. We were like grasshoppers before them. Instantly, Joshua and Caleb tore their clothes. He said they were men of a different spirit. It's not like they lied. The land they went to was the land of giants. They were men with ten toes and ten fingers. They were, some of them were over 200 feet tall. The era of the giants is gone. The giants were not mortal men. The Bible spoke of certain men. He said they were beastly. They were like lions. Some men grew beards like lions. Their hands go carry 
the weight of five men. They were tall. They were giants. So the guys were not lying. But the problem is that they were not aware who was with them. So the battle is not against the mountain. The battle is against your self-awareness in God. The day you know, every mountain becomes an opportunity of manifestation. So we don't see the size of mountains. We see the size of who comes with us. That's the first command of going this thy might. It's an awareness. So when he told him, go in this thy might, he brought him into a syllabus and he began to educate him. The almighty man of valor. He said, I will be, in, I will be with you. And the guys still have not understood. And then he told him the second thing. The second thing in the command is sacrifice. You can be aware, but if you have not entered the gate of sacrifice, it will be like a joke. The moment you leave the conference, the energy will leave you. So the way to interact with what comes down is by the verdict of sacrifice. And the first thing that happened was that the guy raised an altar before the angel and he stretched his hand and the stone licked off the sacrifice with fire. And he didn't stop there. That night, he said to him, go and pull down the altar of power and raise another altar unto the Lord. You can never go in this thy might if you leave this conference with that same relationship that violates you. It will be story. You will hear messages, you will enjoy them, but you will never manifest. Because when that awareness comes, the second thing that happens is that a demand of sacrifice is placed on you. Many people will let go of many things to manifest many things see we have good messages but we don't have sacrifice that's why we are weak the weight of a man is not his eloquence the weight of a man is the depth of his consecration the weight of a man is the depth of his sacrifice the stature of a man in the spirit is predicated upon what he can let go when he wanted to raise Abraham he said go and sacrifice thy only son the son that you love I want to make you a friend of God now. But a friend of God must let go of everything. You don't become a friend of God by chance. You become a friend of God by sacrifice. And the guy carried the son. In Genesis 22 verse 5, he said, I am going up to worship. And he tied his son on the altar. And God spake. He said, now I know. What do you mean now I know? Are you not the omniscient God? There are many things God don't know until you begin to sacrifice. Because what makes God know is not in his knowing ability. It is in your sacrificial ability. There's a way men teach God. <laughs> uh. God may know everything, but when he comes around your life, he may not know much until you begin to teach him with sacrifice. You know, people want to hear good things. Go in this thy might. You are a prophet. I see fire on your head. I see light shining on your palm. I see you vomiting a sword. And then they, <laughs> they try and error should tell you that there's an error. Our generation have refused to embrace sacrifice. And that is why we grow poor in darkness. Our time of manifestation will be delayed so long as we hold those things that negate and resist the move of God. You may know all the scriptures. You may master all the doctrines. You may teach it eloquently, but you may not have any manifestation. Because God is not looking for preachers. God is looking for witnesses. There are many preachers, but there are few witnesses. When he sent them out, he didn't send them as preachers. He sent them as witnesses. He said, go into all the world and be witnesses unto me. Be witnesses unto me. And the way they demonstrated it was by sacrifice. When they were beaten, they didn't come back and lament it. They said they thank God that they were worthy to be flogged for the name of the Lord. 
Meanwhile, we are a generation where people are looking for rema and revelation. But every demand that God places, we can never manifest those demands. If you have come on this mountain and you have not dropped anything yet, it means you have not begun to travel. Don't be psyched. Don't be motivated. Men don't become by chance. Everything in the kingdom is an ordered reality. When a spirit begins to woo a man, the first thing he does is that he places demands on that man. He wants to find out how much you can let go. And when you let go, then the spirit begins to saturate you. The spirit begins to saturate you because everything you hold on to that you think is dear to you is not dear to you. You are just being a puppet of another spirit. The things you think you love, you don't love them. You are only playing the cards. You are playing the whispers of another spirit. Everything man holds on to is a revelation of a spiritual dimension. There is nothing we were designed to carry. We were built to carry spirits. You were built to carry spirit. You may think you love watches and then you become obsessed about watches. You are joking. It's a spirit of self-awareness. It's a spirit of lust that is trying to woo you. So that that watch, we make that watch become your, the spirit will make that watch become your God. And after a while, that watch will become more significant to you than God. The day God woos you, you will discover that watch is only needed for, for to, to keep track with time. Watch will no longer add value to you. Because what that spirit wants you to understand is that your value is in the watch. And the moment you think your value is in the watch, you depart from God. But what God wants to tell you is that your value is in him. So everything you use, you use it because it's necessary, not because he adds value to you. That's why when they ask you, who are you? You may say, I am the servant of God. And it's enough. He said, woe unto the city, whom princes eat in the morning, and the nobles eat for pleasure and not for strength. He said, but blessed is the city whom nobles eat for strength and not for pleasure. So a point we come where even the food you eat is to energize you to do the work of God. That's when you have broken the powers of lust because the key for destroying lust is sacrifice. And every time a spirit wants to destroy lust in your life, it begins to place demand. So the second protocol that he taught Gideon was the protocol of sacrifice. Raise an altar. Raise an altar. Raise an altar. And listen, altars in our dispensation is not a block. Altars in our dispensations are deliberate commitments that we make to God upon his demand. Give me some. You want to see a strong man? It's the altars that are littered around his life that reveals his strength. Strong men don't walk around with big muscles. Strong men walk about with altars. They carry those covenants as, as cars all over their body. He said in Genesis chapter 12 verse 7 that the moment Abraham came to the promised land, he raised an altar unto the Lord. In Genesis chapter 13 verse 18, the moment Abraham entered Mamre, he raised an altar unto the Lord. He littered everywhere with altars until even the child that he trusted God for for over 75 years. God met Abraham at the age of 25. Abraham moved at the age of 75 and he trusted God until he was 100. Even that child became a burnt offering. And then you say, Abraham's blessings are mine. The way you enter into Abraham's blessing is to accept Abraham's sacrifice. That's what going this dynamite means. It's not psychology. It will place so much demand on you until you will be lost in God. And when you are lost in God, every time they attempt to find you, God manifests. Every time you talk, they want to hear what you have to say. God manifests. You stretch your hand, God manifests because you have, you have been lost. Everything that is dear to you, he has demanded it from you. You are ready to go in this thy might because that might is not your might. It's the might of God. 
This is the Christianity that the Father has practiced. That's why they have results we don't have. We have all the revelations, but we have no results. Most times they come for a meeting, they say, you are blessed. And the meeting is over. And when you leave, you will be shocked that truly you are blessed. But we come and open 15 scriptures about blessing. And we explain it in Greek and Hebrew. Yet you go, you are not blessed. It's the weight of their sacrifice. I was sharing with my brother yesterday. And he told me that every night that Papa is on this ground, he is walking from 12.30 to 4.30. I said, what? That sacrifice is superior to every sermon he has preached. Because anywhere he goes, before he talks, God appears. We don't have sacrifices. We don't have scars. We don't have commitments. We only have wars and lingo. Go in this thy might. The first is an awareness. The second is sacrifice. And the third is trust. Trust. In Judges chapter 7 from verse 1, he told him, whisper into their ears and tell them, if any man is fearful, let him go back. And I was amazed. 32, 22,000 people went back. Because even when God said, I am with you, his confidence was still the might of Israel. He gathered 32,000 soldiers and God said, tell them, any man who is afraid should go back. 22,000 went back. That was when the guy knew that he was in trouble. And God still looked at him and said, I don't want to win with this crowd so that you don't try to take the glory. Take them to the river. The one that drinks and laughs like a dog. Take note of them. And only 300 men were ready out of 32,000. And when he carried 300 men, he knew that if God doesn't help him, he's finished. If you have not come to that point, you have not begun the journey. You will still go somewhere and you want to do something that you trust apart from God. So God will strip you of everything that forms your confidence. That's the point you get to. And then you have nothing but God. Only 300 men. Something you had 32,000 men and you didn't know it was enough. You were still hoping some men will join. Now you are left with 300. And God said, now you are ready. So what does it mean to be ready? When the spirit says you are ready, the indices are different. When the spirit says a man is ready, it's not because the, the horse is ready for battle. When the spirit says a man is ready, it means that man is ready to trust him. The man can now trust him so the spirit can manifest through him. Now you are ready. And the guy, he was helpless. But his helplessness became a channel that God will enter. Because every time he was self-confident, God had no room. Until he got to a point where he became selfless, helpless. And God said, now you are ready. Because now you have more than enough room for me. I can break into your life even when you are sleeping. You know, when a man is full of himself, it will be difficult for his spirit to get his attention. But when a man becomes helpless, even when he's sleeping, he's hoping that God will whisper. And even around 1 a.m., if God taps him, he will wake up. The day you have plenty, prayer becomes hard. The day you have a need, prayer becomes an asset. It's a sign that there is nothing else to anchor your confidence on. Then you are ready. The third protocol is the protocol of trust. And you don't get into trust by studying. You get into trust by becoming helpless before the Lord. The reason many people cannot go before God is because they have something else they trust. Have you there before when you are looking for school fees and then you thought your uncle will give you? You now say, Father, I trust you for school fees. Meanwhile, while you are praying, is the phone call you will make to your uncle you are hoping. It's when you make that phone call and your uncle tells you, I don't have money. That time when you come back, you will not say, Father, thank you. You will go and lock the door and kneel down. Because if God doesn't come through, you are doomed. But the beautiful thing is every time men trust, God comes through. 
These are the truths that are not taught our generation. We are not taught. We do a lot of gimmicks to save face. But if we will do what the fathers did, then we must follow the rigid protocol that they followed. He said, go in this thy might. If I ask you now, what is your might? What is your strength? You will be shocked that you will come many things before you remember God. If I ask some people, what is your strength? They will say, my father is the brother to the vice president. <laughs> you can't do business in deep waters. Because they say, woe unto the man that puts his trust in the arm of flesh. He has judged it that it will fail. What is your strength? I graduated with first class. <laughs> that does not negate hard work in any way. But that is a platform. What is your strength? I'm a lawyer. Wait until the media nights come. When the media nights come, you will discover that they don't have regard for certificate. When the media nights come, you will discover that everything in the flesh is a disadvantage. That was what Moses knew. David knew. When he came before Goliath, Saul gave him his armor. You know, the armor of Saul was relevant until he saw somebody that was taller than him. Saul was head and shoulder above everybody in Israel. When Goliath came, Saul discovered he was a dwarf. So his armor lost relevance. But here was a boy that knew the language of trust. He came out of the wilderness. And with his bare hands, he had killed a lion. He had killed a bear. And when Saul gave him his armor, he said, no, I'm not used to this one. There is something I know. It's the covenant of Israel. And when he saw Goliath, his height was not a factor. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? All the Israeli army were looking at the, the armory, the garment. They saw the spear of Goliath. Six people were carrying the spear. When David came, he didn't censor him in the natural. He said, you are uncircumcised. And because you are uncircumcised, I will win. Because I tread on covenant, not on physical stature. He knows trust. And when he stood up, the Bible said that as Goliath felt mocked, out of anger, Goliath wanted to release anger. He said, David chaffed at him. How do you pursue a giant? Are you crazy? A man that can squeeze you with his hand. He is doing business in deep waters. He knew what he was standing on. He was standing on a covenant that was unseen. Because he said, who are the Israelites? Unto whom pertained the covenants. And so long as he stood on that covenant, Goliath was a dwarf. Can I tell you something about the covenant? Every Israeli man that stands on the covenant, there's one description the Bible calls him. He said it's like the cedars of Lebanon. The cedars of Lebanon, they grow up to 300 feet tall. Goliath was nine feet tall. On the strength of the covenant, David was 300 feet tall. So David was more than three, 30 times taller than Goliath in the spirit. That was what he knew. He was aware. He had regards for the covenant. Go in this thy might is a summon to trust. Go in this thy might is an activation of an awareness. Go in this thy might is a demand to erect an altar. When these three things are achieved, then the fourth protocol is activated. That's when strategy comes. Many people begin with strategy. So they work with their minds. The first thing he told him is, I will be with you. The second thing he told him is, raise an altar. The third thing he told him is, tell those who are afraid to go, trust me. When this tree was achieved, he now came to the realm of strategy. Because that strategy is no longer a function of human wisdom. It's a function of divine direction. Divine direction. Men come into spiritual accuracy when they tap into the frequency of divine direction. Most of the things you do in the flesh will fail because the spirits you are dealing with are older than your ancestors. They knew your great-grandfather. They knew your grandfather. They know your father and they know you. The only time you become older than those demonic spirits is when you tap into the frequency of God 
because God is the only one who was, who is, and who is to come. Spirit inspired strategies. And when he entered into that realm, there was no way he could be defeated. And 300 men shut down a nation. I was sharing somewhere. I said, why does it look as if our demographic is inconsequential? If 30 madmen come into this camp, there will be crisis. 30 madmen, if they enter this camp, there will be crisis. They will turn this camp upside down. 30. Look around you. How many are we? Ask yourself. How many things have I done by express divine instructions? The reason you divine instruction is scarce is because you have violated the first three protocols. You have violated them. Your trust is in other things. You have no altars around your life and you are not aware that God is with you. When these three strategies are in place, when problem come, it's not a challenge. You just know like you know your name, that God will come through. You are not saying it because you heard somebody say it. You are saying it because it's the reality of your life. It's when this fourth strategy is engaged that manifestation becomes a byproduct. Manifestation is not what we struggle with. It is actually the proof that we are witnesses. Because what we call manifestation is God coming on the scene to validate what you are doing. Manifestation is not an expression of the abilities of God necessarily. The abilities of God are manifest even in creation. God is not obscured. God is visibly manifested even in creation. The rocks bear the testimonies of God. The trees bear the testimonies of God. The hanging sky is a testimony of God. When God manifests through you, it's a validation of what he's doing through your life. It's a testimony that you are his witness. But when we begin to struggle with manifestation, it's because the first four protocols are not in place. Let me share with you a few people that kept this demand and you will see what they did. There were men in scripture that every time they wanted to prove the existence of God, they look, they asked men to find out what is the most impossible thing that you know. That's where we want to start from. You know, if you have not journeyed deep, when you come for a meeting, you are looking for what looks like we walk and then you start from where it's soft so that by all means you are not embarrassed. It's not the men that have kept this protocol. When they show up, they find out where is the hardest part of the job. That's where we want to start from. Because the moment they crack it, every other thing opens. I will show you this man in scripture. The Bible spoke of Samuel. Israel fought against Samuel when he told them God was their king. They thought Samuel wanted to create a name for himself. And he said, you have not sinned against me. You have sinned against God. And he said, hope this is dry season. Does rain fall in dry season? All of them bought testimony that no rain doesn't fall. And he said, today. He didn't check the weather condition. He said, today, God will thunder from heaven. And instantly, it began to rain. By what powers? Is it because he's Samuel? No. He has gone in this dynamite. Men who go in this dynamite, their job description is to unveil the hidden dimensions of Christ. So when they come, they make impossibilities possible. When they come, the things that mortals have given birth on, that is what they bring to bear to prove that there is a God that hides himself. Moses showed up 
the princes of Israel wanted to challenge his authority. I don't lead you because I'm a technocrat. You know, there's a form of church leadership where you use manipulation. He said, I don't lead you because I'm a technocrat. I lead you because I am a witness. When I stand with you on earth, my head is in heaven. I'm not playing, I'm not walking with you. I am a God among you. I have journeyed into waters that is forbidden for ordinary men by the strength of my sacrifice. Moses was looking for God for 40 years. He had a body in Egypt. He left Egypt and for 40 years he was seeking God until he came to Horeb. Such a man have no ambition. He has died many years ago. And when he showed up, he told them that if the ground does not open its mouth and swallow you, I am not a servant of God. There are days when you don't need preaching. You need to bring the rod of the spirit to demonstrate God. A generation will not believe. This is how this man kept the heritage of God from one generation to another. We attempt to keep the heritage of God by preaching and by human intelligence. It doesn't work. And the ground opened up and swallowed them. Elijah came against 450 prophets of Baal. And he told them, the God that comes down as fire, he is the true God. They have not seen it before. And then he told them, go and try. And they were trying from morning to evening. And he was making a mockery of them. Why was he not afraid? What did he know? Where has he turned it to in the spirit? The God that answers by fire, that is the true God. The first question is, why was he not afraid that God, these people may do something? Because when he said it, he was not only occasioning the appearance of God, he locked the heaven from the prophets of Baal. So he was doing two things at the same time. The first thing he was doing is that he shot the manifestation of the prophets of Baal. So they tried. If they don't know that dimension, they won't attempt. They tried from morning to evening. They were cutting themselves with stone and the guy was laughing. Why was he so sure it would not happen? He walked from Israel. And when they were tired, he came back and he went around the protocol. And he set 12 stones. He raised an altar consistent with the 12 tribes of Israel. Because who are the Israelites? Unto whom pertained the covenant. Every time I activate the powers of the covenant, God will show up. Even if he hides in the thickest cloud, he will appear. I know this God. I'm not telling stories. I have journeyed to where he dwells. Hope you know when Job was trying to make a statement that was void of wisdom. He said, who is this that darkens counsel by wars without knowledge? He said, declare thou if you have understanding. He said, have you traveled to where light dwells? There's a place where mortal men are, bre are brought into illumination. There's a place where men are educated by spirit. And one of those places is where you encounter God and he teaches you the syllables of the spirit. The guy didn't need to shout. He came and he erected an altar. And as he lifted his voice, God came and licked up the water from the altar. There was 100% precision and assurance because it was not trial and error. It was life in the spirit. Ministry is not puppet business. Ministry is life in the spirit. Because the idea of ministry is to bring witness to a God that hides himself. His name is called Jehovah Zephaniah. He's the God that hides himself in the deep darkness. Only men who can travel there can bring him to the light. He said in Exodus chapter 20 verse 21, he said, and God hid himself in the thick darkness. And he said, Moses entered into the darkness where God dwells. He takes sacrifice to journey that far. If you don't know the language of sacrifice, Every time you will end the journey, you will abort mission. And we abort mission, but we come and hope that by chance something will happen. Things don't happen by chance. Things are made to happen. It's 
say, come up hither. And an 80-year-old man climbs a mountain that is over 6,000 feet tall. That is the mountain most of us cannot climb in two hours prayer. And when we pray for 30 minutes, we go out and answer phone calls. We pray for 10. When he begins to place a demand on flesh, then we step aside. And then we receive earthly ventilation. And then we come back. So we take one step forward. We take three steps backward. We take one step forward. We take four steps backward. Because we can ascend Sinai. 80 year old man. Sinai is over 6,000 feet tall. Every time Moses stood upon Sinai, he died. Because there is a height you get to. And you can't lift your legs. There's a height you get to. All your feet are blistered. But because you want to see the face of Elohim, you will keep climbing. There are times when you pray, you can't stand anymore, but you keep praying. You keep praying because the God that hides himself must manifest. The reason we can't walk into the rivers of life is because we have negated the ways of the altar. He said, I, John, I was in the isle called Patmos. Patmos means death. The island of my dying. So every minute that man spent in Patmos, he died. Every second in Patmos was a verdict of death. I was in the island of my dying. And suddenly, I looked back. I heard a voice. He had migrated from the dwellings of men. Because so long as you are alive, men will keep you here. The way out of this realm is death. I was in that island. And the moment he died, he heard the trumpet. And God said, I am Alpha Omega. And instantly he turned. That word turn is not to turn around. That word turn is translation. It's a migration from the boundary of flesh into the womb of the spirit. Death had taught him another transport system. And he turned. And when he turned, he didn't look at the Isle of Patmos no more. He said, I saw seven lampstands. He had moved from the visible into the invincible because he accepted that protocol. This is how men rule. Many times, flesh is too noisy. Too noisy. Too noisy. So noisy. You didn't pray because you were in the congregation. You prayed because you ascended. Many have never journeyed that far. And if we don't journey that far, the Midianites will intimidate us. Because one thing they learn to do is to guard themselves in a way that will be intimidated. When they appear, they appear to choke and to suffocate your confidence. The only way you can stand is when you look beyond time. When you gaze, you gaze into the mountain of God. And every time you speak from there, it doesn't matter how tall they are. You are like the cedars of Lebanon. Goliath can be nine feet tall, but the cedars of Lebanon, they are 300 feet tall. Not even the contrary wind can pull them down. The reason is because before they ascend that height, the root of the cedar is over 200 feet deep. So the cedar can bend, it will stand again. They don't break. They have gone so deep. The water that sustains them are not shallow. They are of the deep. Go in this that might. It's not a cliche. It's a protocol. From an awareness that God is with you. Into a place of altars. And then to a place of trust. And then to a place of divine strategies. Then you enter into manifestation this is why we come for conferences like this we spend more time praying because it's not a discipleship class 
is a place of encounter. And if all you came into is this auditorium, you didn't participate in this conference. reality it is the gate of prayer doctrines can teach you how to master the affairs of life and dominate this world but life in the spirit is beyond the teaching it's a walk it's a walk it's a walk he said have you not heard has it not been said to you that the everlasting God fainted not neither is he weary there is something that only God has in his quiver. It is an ability to remain fresh and self-sustaining. So whatever God does, depletion is not captured within his context. He said, but he giveth power to the faint. So a man can be feeble. A man can be weak. He said, they that have no might, he increases strength. But how does he do it? He said, they that wait upon the law. He said, they mount up. They mount up. They mount up with wings like the eagles. There is a technology that awaits men. But as they begin the process of waiting, even though flesh is weak, something is happening. The spirit man begins to rise. That's why in Zechariah chapter 2 verse 13, he said, be silent, O flesh, that the God of Jacob may arise. They mount up with wings like the eagle. And he said, they enter somewhere. Where they enter is where God dwells. He says, suddenly, the weak man begins to run. And he's no longer fainting. Suddenly, he begins to walk. He's no longer weary. What has happened? He has exchanged the strength of man with the strength of God. That was what Jesus demonstrated on the Mount of Transfiguration. He said, as he prayed. As he prayed, he said the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment began to glister. So the way Jesus ascended was by prayer. He was by prayer. Every time he wanted to interact in the mountains of God, he didn't go to look into the sky. He went to his closet and as he begins to labor, he looked as if he's going deep what is actually going high. Because when you go deep, you are actually ascending. The journey to height is in depth. It's as you dig into the waters that your feathers are activated. The feathers, the eagle dimension is the glory dimension. There are four faces of God. The four faces of God are the face of the lion, the face of the eagle, the face of the ox, and the face of the man. Because these are the glory dimensions. And every time a man wants to enter the eagle dimension of glory, what he does is that he presses on the altar as he prays. After a while, his wings come. You don't know where they are. They are in Zion. He said in Songs of Solomon chapter 4 verse 4, that upon the ear of Mount Zion are the shields of many warriors. As you begin to pray, a point comes. Sometimes you don't just ascend. What happens is that you connect to the patriarch that is in your spiritual lineage. You may begin to pray and all of a sudden you will run into Enoch. That's when you will know that men don't die. Righteous men don't die. They translate. And we don't need to leave this body to translate. By prayer, we can translate. I went to Sadhu Savarai's conference. Before he came out to preach, 
he strode out and told us that as he was in the room, Isaiah came to him. I said, what do you mean? Which Isaiah are you talking about? Is it the one I read in the Bible? Yes, they didn't die. They translated. And when we pray, we also translate. That was why Jesus was praying. Moses and Elijah came to him. They don't die. They translate. And when you want to know where your strength is, begin the project of prayer. As you pray, you will be shocked that the same Baba Lola they told you about, he can just be strolling. And then you'll see him, you say, sir, what is happening? And then he begins to bring you into death. This is not psychology. These are secrets that are locked in Zion. That's why God doesn't bother if a man is failing. If a man is failing, he knows what to do. There is a strength that David had that made him defeat his adversary. If you join in the spirit, you will find it. Because these things are not lost. They are kept for sons. They are kept. They are the inheritances of sons. But how many people can ascend? How many can ascend? When you begin to pray, suddenly your appetites begin to cry. Instead of you to shut them and move. And move. He said, as Jesus was praying in Gethsemane, he said he sweat was like the clock of blood. That's what travail is. As you begin to travail, sometimes you die and you stay there because you know there is no road backward. The only road in the kingdom is upward and forward. Who told you you are weak? You don't know your lineage in the spirit. That's why you think you are weak. Your lineage in the spirit may not be your biological father. You may come from Kogi state, but when you enter the spirit, you will discover that you are of the same clan with the patriarch Enoch. I know it. You will discover that you are not necessarily from Ibadan. Where you came from is a place in Christ. And there are some men that have translated. And when you begin to journey, you join them. You can travel there and come back. And when you come back, the realm will come with you. This is how we win. This is how we win. Do you think the patriarchs, they succeeded because they were intelligent? There were spirits whispering to them constantly. I was reading a scripture to them a while ago. Exodus 32 verse 30. Moses told Israel, wait for me. I will go and make an atonement on your behalf. What do you mean? Where are you going to? Are you the only one who can go there? Are you the only one who can go there? When God invited them to come, they ran away because they had idols in their heart. Wait! And Moses went and was negotiating with God. And I heard the most arrogant statement of my life. He said, forgive these people. And in case you don't, God have not spoken. He said, in case you don't, blot my name out of your book of life. What do you mean by that? Who are you talking to? Is it the monarch of Zion you are talking to like that? He has learned something. So Moses knew that in Zion there was a throne for him. So he had audacity to talk. He had audacity. He has done it far. He has done it. He has done it. A point came. God began to tell Israel, even if you call Moses and Samuel to pray, I will not answer. Because these were men that none of their walls fell to the ground. How did they get there? This is what it means to go in this dynamite. There is a dimension in Christ that only you can host. But it's not on earth. It's not on earth. Like John, you must hear a voice from Zion. And when that voice comes, you will turn and you will enter into your reality. That is when, that's what creation is waiting for. He said the endless expectation of creation. He waited. He waited. Creation is in travail. Is under the bondage of corruption, but it is waiting for sons. Sons are not grown up people in the kingdom, sons are those who have seen him. Because when you see him, you are changed. The way you wear his image is by beholding him. They have traveled and they have looked upon his countenance. Prayer is not something they motivate people, you are only motivated when you don't know that in it is the road to reality. So you reign, you ancient Zion's king, Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. You reign, 
of the prophets and he stumbled on something he read that Enoch walked with God and was not and he said is this only a prerogative of Enoch and he realized no the name of Enoch is not written there Enoch only entered by alignment and Elijah said if Enoch went there I will go there and he pressed his way into the same dimension these things are waiting for songs. Most times, the men preaching to you, they don't have half the stature that you have. I shared with them, I told them, it's only in Christianity that they rank people based on when you came to church. In the demonic cove, they rank people based on the illumination of reality that they carry. So a 10-year-old girl can be a grandmaster in an awkward kingdom. There's a reality. The man preaching to you may not have half of the stature that you have. The problem is that you have not journeyed in reality. We teach a Christianity without altar. We teach a Christianity without consecration. We teach Christianity without purity. I'm an apostle, I'm popular, but you are a fornicator. And you think you are a witness. No, men may clap. But when spirits come, they know the ones that have rank. They know. Because they are not looking for preachers. They are looking for witnesses. 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 That's why we have no stature territorially. Do you have an idea how many messages you have heard? Has he not taught you already that messages are not enough? Pray in the Holy Ghost for one minute. Break forth, O fountains of the deep, cry out, God, us. You are mighty on your throne. You run, you run, you run, you run, God, us. You are mighty on your throne. Break forth, O fountains of the deep, cry out. to enter next year some people enter 2021 in September because the realms are not governed by time when you get there you can take anything this is why we claw this is why we press in the spirit there are virgin dimensions in God that we must touch in our lifetime Miranda si brata fa chi da bondere di gapare. Alea. Zona 
resonance in the spirit. Let there be a resonance in the spirit. The voice of God is upon many waters. The voice of God it breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. We resonate with the voice. We resonate with the voice. We resonate with the voice. Jesus. In the name of Jesus. If you can, just be quiet for a second. I told you tonight is just to, to stir the waters. The senior minister is coming up. It's important to sustain the decorum. But listen. The only limitation you have is the one you place on yourself. The first day I was carried in the spirit, I saw myself and I was burning with fire. So I knew I had an inheritance with God. And from that day, things turned around. You have not traveled, you've not seen yourself. There are seven things I would have touched. Prayer is just the first. And I didn't even have time to talk about it. But if I were you, I will pray until I hear the whispers of Zion. That's where prayer begins from. When you are translated, and you enter into your reality in God. dropped in your life now am I sure that you are ready for what you have received the Lord bless you man of God the Lord bless you let me celebrate Apostle Michael Rocco the Lord bless you more grace man of God Pastor Chinto will be coming now it's a terrible night I don't know how tomorrow will look like. But before we proceed in this, Jesus. 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 Agaba la tebrosi severia. Gimena kalaba tebrosi. 